So we're going to be having a quick run through of the uh, left atrial anatomy. And I think the first thing to talk about is the anatomical position and the fact that the left atrium is a true posterior structure. And really, the anterior part of the heart is made up of the right ventricle. And usually, only the left atrial appendage is visible when the heart is viewed from the anterior aspect. And because of the oblique nature of the uh, transeptal plane, the left atrial chamber is actually more posterior and superior to the right chamber. And as such, the left pulmonary veins will enter the posterior part of the left atrium slightly more superior than the right. So just by way of orientation, if we look at this prosection, which is actually being rotated uh, to the right, so you can see more of the left-sided structures, we can see that um, you have the anterior interventricular artery uh, running alongside the great cardiac vein in the AV, uh, anterior AV interventricular uh, sulcus. And then on the right side, uh, and then the left side with the ventricle, and then here you can see the prominent uh, oracle of the left atrium and the oracle of the right atrium, otherwise known as the left uh, appendage and right appendage. I think an important point is to realise that the ascending aorta uh, originates to the right and posterior to the pulmonary trunk. And something we'll talk about a bit more is the relationship of the left atrial appendage to the left superior pulmonary vein, I'll just keep losing the pointer, um, and the left pulmonary artery. So by way of blood supply to the left atrium, it branches from the circumflex artery. But interestingly, the venous drainage comes from this oblique vein of the left atrium, or the vein of Marshall. And the point where the vein of Marshall joins with the great cardiac vein, and we saw from the previous slide where that's located, many regard that as the beginning of the actual coronary sinus. And there is a valve at that point, uh, the valve of Buissant, and that also is a marker of where the coronary sinus begins. So I'll leave you with this question about, uh, and maybe it's one for the pub, but how many valves are there in the heart? And I think the answer is seven. And we can talk about it later. OK, so when we talk about internal features then, look, the left atrium is really smooth-walled throughout, except for the finger-like appendage, which contains the pectinate muscles. Compare that to the right atrium, which has all the, the extensive uh, network of pectinate muscles. Now, obviously, the left atrium shares the septum with the right atrium. And a notable landmark on the left atrial side is the valve of foramen ovale. And really, that's the remnant of the septum primum. And after birth, it's the remnant of the septum primum that is this small flap of tissue that covers the foramen ovale on the left side. Now, compare this to the right side with the fossa ovalis, where you had the septum primum fusing with the septum secundum. You get this depression, which is the fossa ovalis on the right side. And the ridge that goes around it is the limbus of the fossa ovalis. And that's really a landmark on the right atrial side. But on the left atrial side, you can see you have this crescent-like margin of the thin, fa thin flap valve of the foramen ovale. But it's important to realise when you look from the right atrium that you can identify the fossa ovalis, specifically the floor of the fossa ovalis, because that will mark the true septum. And if you look at this histological section, you can see that you can identify the thin area, both on the right side marking the fossa ovalis, on the left, which would be the thin flap valve of the foramen ovale, and that's the true septum. But you need to compare that to the muscular rims. I'll try and find it on the the muscular rims on either side, which some regard as the muscular septum, but it's not the true septum. And indeed, if you did a transeptal puncture from the right right atrium into, for instance, this more anterior muscular septum there, you may well end up somewhere in the transverse sinus or worse still in the aorta. So changing tract, we know that up to about one third of the population has an atrial septum that doesn't completely 
close, and you can, that will result in a patent for Raymond Ovali. And here, it's that upper margin of the thin flap vowel that will overlay the fossa, but it doesn't actually become fused to it. I won't spend long talking about the floor of the left atrium because there's cardiac surgeons here that could give you a masterclass just on this anatomical view here, and I know there's a symposium coming up on the mitral valve itself. But I'd just like to say that the vestibule is yet another smooth part of the left atrium. It's a smooth walled outlet um, that surrounds the mitral orifice. Moving on to the posterior and lateral walls. The posterior venous component receives the four pulmonary veins, and so you have the right superior, right inferior, left superior, and left inferior pulmonary veins. An interesting point is this, the mitral isthmus, which is this region on the lateral wall bounded by the mitral valve inferiorly, and then extending superiorly to the ostium of the left inferior pulmonary vein, and I'm sure there's electrophysiologists here that will tell you that that can be a, a site of ablation for left atrial flutter. The left atrial appendage attaches to the superior lateral aspect uh, of, the, of the left atrium. And I think it's, it's nice that you can actually look at the posterior external wall of the left atrium and actually see Bachmann's bundles with its bifurcating branches um, shown, by the arrows, uh, shown by the arrows here. And then in the histological section, you can see it actually crossing over the interatrial groove. And Bachmann's bundle is one of those uh, principal tracks that allow the impulse from the sinoatrial node to actually go across from the right atrium to the left atrium. And you can actually see those fibres on good prosections when you look at the external surface of the left atrium. And then with the left atrial appendage, which we're going to talk a lot about today, um, it's obviously smaller than on the right, but there's notable variation in size, for example, when you think about patients who have AF and their left atrium is enlarged. Now, there's no terminal crest on the left, in the left atrium as you would have in the right with the Cristar terminalis, but the border between the appendage and the body of the left atrium is denoted by the os, and there's quite a lot of variation there, and the os marks the beginning of the left atrial appendage and where the actual pectinate muscles are. And then there is also prominently the, the ridge, the ridge of Marshall, Coumadin's ridge, which is between the base of the left atrial appendage and the ostium of the left superior pulmonary vein, and as our American colleagues would say, that's the Q-tip sign on a transesophageal echocardiogram and can sometimes be mistaken for a thrombus in the left atrial appendage. We look at the pulmonary veins, and it's an interesting histological section taken throughout uh, uh, the uh, right superior pulmonary vein from the atrium all the way to the lung. And you can see that there's actually myocardium from the left atrium that extends along the outer aspect of that venous wall to form this myocardial sleeve. And I guess that's why when you know, a pulmonary vein might be isolated, you may actually see some potential still coming from that area because you've actually got bits of cardiomyocytes within the pulmonary vein itself. Now we know generally there's four pulmonary veins, but in some series, up to 20% of people can have three right-sided pulmonary veins, so a superior, middle, and inferior. And you know, up to 10% may actually have a common left or right-sided vein. Now, I think when we look here, just, it's interesting to note the relationship between the right superior pulmonary vein to the union of the uh, SVC to the right atrium, and that's no surprise when you think of something like a sinus venosus ASD um, and the fact that almost all of those uh, uh, patients will have anomalous drainage of this right superior uh, pulmonary vein into the superior vena cava. Also, we can note the relationship, the close relationship between the superior pulmonary vein and the actual left atrial appendage. So I think clinically what's really important to realise is the fact that the right pulmonary artery overlies the roof of the left atrium. So if we're sticking catheters in the left atrium or if we're putting devices uh, in the left atrial appendage, it's important to know where the, the pulmonary arteries run. And likewise, when we look at the left pulmonary artery, it has a close relationship, you can see, to the left atrial appendage. Other important relationships, uh, both anteriorly and posteriorly to the left atrium, um, we touched on it, but you know, the anterior wall of the left atrium is just behind the aorta. It has a relationship through the transverse sinus. And you know, there's a region of the left atrium anterior wall that is quite thin, down to 1.5 millimetres in some cases, and that's really known as this unprotected area. 
And the posterior wall is also um, relatively thin. And for the students, you know, you can see its relationship to the esophagus. And this is why you can do transesophageal echocardiograms and see, you know, the left atrium in full view and the mitral valve. Um, but that also can be quite thin. The left atrium can be quite thin when you look at the level of the superior pulmonary veins. And finally, just to finish up, we'll just talk a little bit about the nerves. And, you know, we often focus about the phrenic nerves, and justifiably so, particularly when you talk about cardiac surgery. But I guess in reality, when we're talking about pulmonary vein isolations, you know, the right phrenic nerve is in you know, proximity to the right pulmonary veins, um, but not as close as something like the esophageal plexus, which I'll talk about in a moment. But on the left-hand side, there isn't really a close relationship between the left phrenic nerve and the, and the pulmonary veins. It's more actually to do with the, the uh, left atrial appendage, as you can see there. But I think by far what's more important, as we saw from the previous slide, is that close relationship between the esophagus and the left, um, and the left atrium. And what overlies the esophagus is the esophageal plexus. And that's derived from both the sympathetic sympathetic chains on either side, but more importantly from the vagus nerves. And the vagus nerves form this anterior and posterior trunk over the uh, esophagus as it then enters into the thoracic diaphragm uh, at the vertebral level T10. And at that point where the esophagus goes through the esophageal hiatus, which is formed by this right cruise of the diaphragm that goes across to the left. And at that point, the vagus nerves form an anterior and posterior trunk. And so obviously, this relationship here then between the esophagus and say if you're doing an isolation of the left superior uh, pulmonary vein becomes very important and then the effects of that with the vagus nerve and its extensive innervation uh, of the gut um, you can get, leads to dysfunction there. So we'll finish up there with just some of the key points which I won't uh, read through but uh, more for you uh, to have a look at later if you wish. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much.